。行，那就时间。你们后面几个同学快点啊！先坐下，先进来坐下来吧。先进来，先进来坐下来。别搞了，那进到前面，到前面来坐下来。好，那这个今天下午呢就非常高兴，我们请来了呢这个师师法经的主编啊。呃，我给大家讲个情况，就是我的我一个博士生叫贾林，贾林发来了不？贾立帆做了一下统计啊，就这个今天中午他也跟我讲，就是呃在世外经典上发文呢，中国现在是绝对第一，然后国内绝对第一就是中南大学，然后中南大学大概就是我们研究学院就第一了，所以我们在那发文发的蛮多，而且我一直以为这个阴阳因子现在不讲究这个东西了，我一直以为阴阳因子二点零四，我这个我的脑袋停在前几年，它是一区三点三了。是吧？应该挺好。这个人，这个主编呢是非常非常有学问的一个人。今天我们有幸把他请来，到我们的院里面来做报告，希望大家都认真听。然后报告做完了以后呢，是是在楼下吧，李先生？哎，在楼下。在楼下还有一个座谈会，那屋子不是太大，但是欢迎大家呃都呃参加，是吧？如果人多了，我们就站着说也没问题，是吧？呃，我简单介绍一下啊，这个呃，皮特森教授呢是九八年获得南非开普敦大学。化学工程博士学位，现在是开普敦大学教授，研究生院的院长。呃，你们有兴趣读研究生也可以跟他联系，是吧？矿物矿物加工与提取冶金，因为这是矿物系写的，所以他就把矿物加工放在前面。实际上他就搞石化冶金的。海州马克勒的呃主编，呃国际生物冶金的委员委员会的委员，南非采矿与冶金协会西开普敦分会的主席。他主要研究领域就是石化冶金，已经发了六十多篇文章了，写了四部专著，呃，有一系列的这个科研项目呢，呃，都呃实行了公益应用。今天他给大家做的这个题目呢是，呃，呃 ，overview of per percolation leaching process， 呃 ，moving from copper gold and uranium to new applications。那么我们热烈欢迎。
house is entire assumption at the bottom. Um, and in, in real life, the operations are very large scale reactors. So this is just a kind of a typical operation. As you can see here, you have an open pit mine. This is the mining pit uh, where the ore is, is being extracted and in fact and then just crushed and put onto these leach pads, as you see here. So the footprint of the heat leach operation is actually larger than that of the mine, but, uh, or, or the mining pit in the, in the ground. But uh, as so you can see, it is a fairly large scale operation, but the advantages of that you are not actually transporting anything off-site rather than the uh, finished product. And in this case, the finished product is copper, like most heat leach operations. A little bit to uranium, and I'll come to that in a bit more detail now. Um, the, the, um, and the principle is, again, as you can see, the irrigate on the top, you collect at the bottom in uh, collection ponds, uh, and then you process the uh, pregnant leach solution. So here to demonstrate this in a, in a, in a slightly simplified schematic, um, we have the, um, the heap irrigation from the top. You have built the heap normally on a layer of coarser material, a drainage, and on top of a, uh, a liner of a impermeable material. So the solution that trickles through will not seep into the ground but <coughs> flow along the bottom of the line, uh, lining into the solution collection pond, the ditches, and from there then to the PLS pond. And then the PLS will be processed uh, in a metal extraction plant. Um, uh, so if it's copper, it will normally use solvent extraction to, to um, extract the copper and then return the uh, leach liquor to be recyclated and on top of the heat. If it's gold, then uh, it's an it's a, it's a car activated carbon absorption, and if it's uh, uranium, it's iron exchange, but the principle is always the same. The leach liquor gets processed and returned onto the heat, uh, uh, and then that way circulated. There is a particular formation of uh, heat leaching where you actually have actively encourage uh, bacteria to grow, form of dump leaching where you take run of mine ore, but in most cases heat leaching the ore is slightly crushed and pre-screen usually to less than 25 millimeter. And also historically, generally nowadays heaps are operated with even smaller sizes, 20 or even 15 millimeter uh, rocks in order to ensure uh, a relative good uh, liberation while maintaining uh, still the properties of a solution percolating through the ore. So the material is normally agglomerated to get the fine material to stick closely with the coarser particles. Um, and the, uh, the, the heaps are not just a pile, I mean I say it's loosely a pile of rock, but in actual fact they're quite carefully engineered, um, consisting of, uh, of prepared grounds, pads, um, uh, to which you pile the material. And sometimes you actually build several layers on top of one another. You can actually see this here in this picture here in the front. You actually can see that there's two heaps on top of one another. So you leach the one and then you build another one on top. So you don't have to prepare the ground uh, repeatedly um, for that purpose. Applications, as I already mentioned, uh, copper gold cyanide leaching. That's where uh, it historically originated. Um, the acid leaching of copper oxide um, and bio and chloride leaching of secondary copper sulfides. Um, so copper oxide is now a very common uh, application of, uh, of heat leaching for low, particularly for low grade materials um, because it works really easily and it works really well. Copper sulfides is a little bit more problematic. Uh, you need an to create the oxidative environment. 
it's a bioleaching or uh, it helps or we use chloride as a, as a uh, complexing agent. Um, the big price in, in copper leaching is still charcoal pyrite, copper iron sulfide, because that is part the primary copper sulfide materials are quite refractory to, to leaching, and, uh, uh, but there is of course a, a great uh, interest in achieving that for, for heat leaching. Bioxidation of copper gold bearing pyrites. So here the material is actually um, basically is, uh, used as a pretreatment method for certain gold ores where the gold is locked into pyritic uh, material um, or I've seen Then also in heat leach operation, uh, but not as widely. Um, you find uranium leaching also in a different uh, percolation leaching process that's called uh, in situ leaching. Uh, I'll come back to that a bit later. Okay, first we focus on uh, what's actually going on in the heap. So that's a where my research has focused over the past 20 years almost uh, um, trying to understand. The, the complexity of the processes that are going on in heat leaching. So while you can, it's easy to say, okay, we have solution going in, clean solution going in, pregnant solution coming out, but what is actually going on uh, in the process uh, while it's percolating through the heat? So first of all, we need to distinguish for that a, a, a number of scales in the process. So there's the heat scale, um, that relates particularly to uh, how the solution migrates through the packed ore bed. We have then, if you look at a, uh, a agglomeration of particles that are held together by moisture, um, uh, that, that constitutes what we call the agglomerate scale. And if you then zoom in on a single particle uh, in that agglomerate, it, it, it conceptually kind of open, then you have the rock matrix, we have cracks and pores through our rocks matrix, and we have our mineral grains distributed throughout the rock, which is the mineral that we actually want to leach. So um, it's not nearly as simple because we need to get our reaction to those minerals and the dissolved minerals out of the pores again, out of the heap. Um, and then finally uh, is the, the grain scale, as I call it where you basically have now the individual mineral grain that is just not a pure mineral where the leach reactions are taking place on the surface of the mineral and that is of course where we normally as hydrometallurgists classically look at we look at the reaction at the surface of the pure mineral um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and trying to understand the chemistry trying to understand the reaction kinetics using a pure mineral but we need to now, in a heat leach context, understand that pure mineral sits inside a particle, <coughs> sits inside the agglomerate, sits inside the big heap. So the, the reaction phenomena are really then just a small part of the, um, of the overall transport effects in, in a heap. So I'm having this a little further at the heat scale. Uh, we, we appreciate, okay, solution flows down the, flows down the heat. That's, that's uh, obviously not moving through in it. Particularly oxidative uh, dissolution reactions uh, of sulfide minerals, they, um, when they react with oxygen, whether that is directly chemically or through the facilitation of bacteria, sulfide uh, uh, oxidation is an exothermic reaction and so we're generating heat in the heat 
And that's got to go somewhere, uh, because else the heat would get hotter and hotter. But we have solution transport um, down that will cool the heat. And also, and perhaps more importantly, we have uh, in the oxidative reaction, we need to blow air into the heat. And so the gas flow that occurs upwards that provides the, uh, the air uh, uh, will uh, also transport heat upwards because of the humidity. Because obviously the hotter it gets, the more the water will evaporate in the pores and be transported out of that heat there. And then you also have to account for boundary effects. The sun is shining and a lot of these heaps operate at very high altitude, particularly in Chile where there's a lot of copper heat reaching. Those heaps are situated at three, 4,000 meter altitude. So the solar radiation is quite significant at that altitude and it will end result in surface uh, evaporation and uh, surface uh, thermal effects as well. If we then look at the agglomerate scale, so we're going back now into the hoop, zooming in on a, a clump of particles, uh, we can see that the particles are held together by moisture. Um, so you have larger particles, smaller particles, and moisture sitting between those particles. But heat beads are not saturated, so there are also air pockets, and that's the open spaces between um, uh, those uh, uh, moisture agglomerates. So solution flows seeps now as you irrigate the heat. Somehow the solution seeps through that agglomerate uh, downwards, um, and generally it tends to uh, go through preferential channels, um, and then gas flow moves upwards and has to wind its way through uh, that uh, network of unsaturated pores. So there's a bit of a trade-off between the liquid flow downwards and the gas flow up upwards. They're competing for the same space within the heat bed, and that, that uh, constitutes uh, a certain uh, issues or dynamics of its own. So we again go zoom into again into this, the microspace between uh, between particles. Organisms are too big to be able to migrate inside the rocks. Um, so their reaction products, mostly ferric iron, has to migrate through those pores and cracks in order to, to, to the inside of the individual particle. And, uh, and obviously you still have to have a, a respiration oxygen uptake from the gas bed. Um, then looking at the reaction network at the sort of surface of, a, of an individual uh, rock particle, you have migration, so you need to uh, uh, so give the example of an acid leach reaction where you want to dissolve, say, um, copper oxide. So you need acid to dissolve the copper oxide. The acid is what comes into the heat through the solution flow. So somewhere the acid needs to get to the surface of the particle it then needs to migrate into the pore to react with the mineral grain, dissolve the mineral grain, and the copper will come out uh, uh, into the solution. But of course, the rock is not made out of uh, inert material. The rock will, uh, uh, is made normally out of aluminum silicates, which are all not inert to acid. So if you have an acidic environment, the whole rock will start to dissolve, perhaps not as, as rapidly as the, as the mineral grains, but the rock will also start to dissolve and uh, uh, release a lot of gang uh, uh, components into the aqueous solution. If you have an oxidative leach process, um, and that doesn't have to be biological, I want to stress, um, then it gets a bit more complicated because you now need a redox carrier to facilitate the reaction with the, with the mineral. So normally a redox carrier in most teak leach systems is ferric iron. 
iron three plus, which will migrate into the pore, oxidize the mineral sulfur in particular, and release the value metal, say copper in most cases, and itself be reduced to ferrous iron. And the ferrous needs to be reoxidized to ferric um, by oxygen. The oxygen has to come from the from the gas phase. And, uh, and so we need good contact between the solution and the gas phase in order to facilitate the transfer of oxygen into the gas the liquid phase to facilitate the oxidation of ferrous back to ferric iron, which can then migrate into the mineral grain. You could, of course, argue that oxygen could itself, itself migrate into the pores, but, uh, and again, as I'll show you a little bit later, the solubility of Also, just uh, occur uh, 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 um, homogeneously with, with uh, the ferrous can be oxidized to ferric, but at ambient and low temperatures, that's a slow reaction. So, it's facilitated in heat leaching, which is obviously at ambient temperatures, it's generally facilitated by bacteria. Those bacteria, you don't necessarily have to actually put them in there, they grow naturally, they occur naturally and really act as a redox catalyst. What you also, what people often forget in heat bleaching, what you also need, you still need acid. Because the reaction for ferrous to ferric with oxygen requires one proton as well. So ferrous plus one proton plus a quarter oxygen reactive ferric and, and, and uh, half a, half a um, water. Okay, then talking about, uh, and I mentioned it already, in-situ leaching, in-situ recovery is also considered a percolation leaching process, although it's not the same as heat leaching. Um, the, the principle is here that you don't actually have to um, dissolve, a, to even mine the material. You rely on a permeable rock material that is situated underground. Uh, in general, a sandstone type material, which is, is, uh, has lots of cracks and pores and is fairly permeable to solution flow, and it's placed on top of an impermeable uh, clay layer or rock bed. And so, what you do in situ leaching, you just pump the solution underground um, through so called injection valves. So, you pump the solution into the ground. Uh, it, it starts to then migrate through that, uh, that porous bed, interact and leach uh, the, whatever it is that you want to extract, and then it can be pumped up again and processed at the surface. So that is, uh, finally, that is normally then uh, used in the context of uh, uranium leaching um, with sulfuric acid and ferric iron again. So it's an oxidative leach process. Uh, the ferric iron is then regenerated at the surface, uh, sorry, the ferrous iron regenerated to ferric on the surface, usually using a hydrogen peroxide, um, and then injected back underground again. Um, it has been also applied to the acid leaching of copper oxide. The same principle, inject an acid solution underground, and somewhere downstream you collect the uh, dissolved copper solution pump it up, up, up or to the surface again. It has been considered for a cyanide leaching of gold, but the risk that you have in, in situ leaching is that your, your cyanide or your solution is not entirely recovered. You might sometimes lose solution. Tropical, uh, when people are considering this for the leaching of rare earth elements, um, this particularly uh, uh, under consideration here in China, 
um, and there's particularly the so-called, uh, we, we call them iron absorption clays, uh, here they're more referred to as the, the weathered crust dilution mm -hmm. deposited clays. Um, the idea is that we have a permeable clay type material that contains valuable rare earth uh, metals absorbed onto the clay structure by injecting uh, uh, exuviant from the top uh, the, uh, of a hill, for example, you are letting then the, uh, the solution seep through the clay material and you basically drill drainage channels underneath the hill in order to recover the solution. So it's a little bit of a hybrid of uh, heat leaching and, uh, and in-situ leaching, um, but uh, the, 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 the Uh, as a commercial technique 
only for very low grade ores, where you really it's not worth to crush them fine and concentrate them up to process them through conventional extractive metallurgy techniques. Heaps also have a large physical footprint. So you see in the picture that I showed here at the beginning. I mean, the heat footprint of the heat operation is larger than that of the mine. Um, and you have rock sitting that you treat with acid or acidic, normally with acidic material, and then when you're done with it, they sit there forever. So you have an un long term environmental burden uh, that is associated with heaps. But then you need to also think about some of the other aspects. Uh, use heat leaching as a, as a, as a technology uh, is actually a low energy uh, technology because you do not have to crush the ore, you don't have to well, only coarsely crush the ore, you don't have to mill the ore to uh, a fine ground material, then to treat it further by flotation or Uh, you can operate it right next to it, the mine site. You don't have to have fancy or sophisticated equipment. You don't need highly qualified operators. It's a relatively simple process to operate. And one thing what people tend to forget about, particularly in terms of the environmental burden, is that spent heaps are actually contain the same mass as tailing stamps from, from minerals processing operations. In minerals processing, you maybe extract 1% of the, of the uh, ore mass in order to, um, uh, to make a concentrate, and the remaining 99% get put onto a tailing stamp, which is put on an impermeable layer in order to provide, pro prevent leachate generation, and it will sit there for eternity and becomes an environmental liability. So, what's different with spent heaps? Because they're sitting on an impermeable layer to collect the leachate um, and, uh, and they contain no more mass than, than a tailing stamp does. So, um, and I'll come back to it, but there's some advantages uh, to, to spent heaps and I'll, I'll, I'll summarize those a little later. Um, we've done a study uh, some years back that looked at heat leaching versus conventional processing for a particular given sulfide ore. In this case, it was a zinc sulfide ore, which um, had been there have been uh, some some uh, studies in uh, using heat leaching to extract zinc from a zinc sulfide ore, and so we compared uh, a number of different processes. The one was being uh, the, the Use the mine material, that we crush it, you mill it, float it, and then use a, a tank leaching process, or we take the uh, flotation concentrate and sell it directly overseas to a refiner. That was two, the, the two conventional routes, and the other route was we take the crushed material, we just agglomerate it, we heat leach it, and then uh, just use the uh, solution that comes off the heat leaching in order to produce zinc material at, uh, on site. Um, and so we did a full process flow sheet study and costing exercise of, the, uh, of this particular material um, and, and all are comparing them on the same basis. Without going into the, uh, the fine details of the numbers, uh, we started off saying we're mining 300,000 tons of ore and we're putting them through these different processes. So in the one case, in the heat leach case, and that's the interesting thing, is you get the lowest zinc extraction. Um, and in the other case, the conventional processing outside, higher zinc extraction, and to sell the concentrate, because that's not processed yet, you get the highest zinc uh, production. But in terms of the whole cost exercise, and I don't really need to go through the details, we actually find that, that um, the um, internal rate of return on the process comes all out more or less the same for the different processes and the net present value for the heat leach process is actually the highest. This is 
because it's a much lower capital investment than a much lower operating cost actually be a competitive technology. But, and there is a big but, um, in this context, um, um, the, the problem is that the, the, the modeling of the heat leach process made one major assumption, which is that uh, it ra relied on this, yeah, sorry, there is a slide missing here, um, um, it relied on the uh, presence of a, um, an assumption that you would be able to extract 70% of the copper within eight months of the operation. Um, so that's possible, but it's only possible if the heat is operated under optimal conditions. And so we did a study, this is the slide that's missing here, and I apologize for that, uh, where we actually said, well, what if it takes longer to extract the heat? Then you basically end up with a higher inventory cost, because you mine your rock today, and you put it on the heat, and you let it sit there for a few months before you get the zinc that you can then sell and uh, uh, get your revenue from. So that's referred to as the inventory cost. And the inventory cost obviously is very strongly dependent on how long your material sits inside the process. And uh, with heat leaching we found, well, if it, the process is not operated uh, optimally, then this, the inventory cost goes up dramatically and the net present It's got nothing to do with technology, it's got nothing to do with the chemistry, it's only about the economics. Because you mine your ore today, you get your money back, your revenue comes down only so many months later. And that actually, so you pay interest basically on the, on the sunken cost for the mining, and that is economically unattractive. Um, so that is the big drawback for heat leaching. And so it can, if it's optimally optimally, <coughs> if it's uh, operated optimally, then you will have a, uh, a situation where you can actually uh, operate the process more economically than, uh, uh, than the conventional ones. But if it's not operated optimally, if the leaching takes too long, then it will not be favorable. Okay, so the question is there for now, what makes heat leaching so slow? And so as I already said, uh, there's a number of aspects that, 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 that play a role. So you have slow reaction kinetics at the low temperatures of the heat. Um, you have unliberated minerals in large rocks. So as I showed you earlier in the, in the picture of the particle, um, the the, some of the mineral grains, because you don't liberate, you don't crush, to, you don't melt to fine powder, you will not actually um, be able to ever access those mineral grains in the, in the rock matrix. You have, if in an oxidative process, you have low aeration rates, so you have to blow air into the heat, but you do solution and you have a big problem with solution channeling and stagnant zones. So let's unpack this a little bit um, uh, further with various studies that we've done uh, in, in, in uh, my department over the years. So one is the mineral extraction from large particles. So just remember what I said, the particles are up to 25 millimeters in, in diameter. So they're quite sizable pieces of rock. That, uh, that you are trying to leach from. And so we did a study where we actually used tomography tools um, to investigate the progress of leaching inside those large rock particles. Um, so the um, picture is not so clear here, but basically what you can do, you can see a mineral particle um, and you can sort of look, with using X-ray tomography, you can look inside the particle and we did leach a particle like this for a year 
And after every, every two months, we took it out and we put it back into the tomography unit and we measured how, what time, the little mineral grains, and you see here the little white specks inside the particle, how they gradually disappeared over time and as a, as a function of, of the radius of the particle. And as you can see here from, from, from this data, you can see the particle, the mineral leaches very rapidly near the surface. So this is the center of the particle. This is the surface. much after 11 months here, that's the orange line. So you're halfway, you're, uh, this is a particle of 50 millimeter diameter. So halfway into that particle, almost nothing leaches here. So the center of the particle does not become leached because of uh, the minerals being too far away from the surface, being too occluded, and basically uh, cannot be extracted. So that would, of course, automatically say, so you need to crush the rock spiner in order to get better extraction. But then you have the problem, of course, finer material is not very conducive to uh, percolation, and I'll come to that now. And in terms of gas-liquid mass transfer, I said already earlier on that oxygen is not very soluble in aqueous solution. Um, um, it's about 8 ppm at ambient temperature uh, in clean water. But mining waters are not clean. They contain acid, they contain dissolved salts, they're often quite saline. So that already influences um, the, um, the solubility of oxygen uh, in, in, in solution, but not much. So the salinity here, the 0.15 molar ionic strength, which is a typical uh, 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 leach solution, it does not affect the solubility of oxygen. Here, temperature versus oxygen solubility does not affect it much. But what actually affects it quite dramatically is the partial pressure of oxygen in the air that it's absorbing from. And so, if you have a heat at high altitude, sea level. And so as a result, the solubility of oxygen in saline water at high altitude is next to nil. It's a dramatically reduced here. It's, it's, it's not even, uh, it's only about uh, uh, yeah, 60, uh, about half of what it is in, uh, in uh, uh, ideal conditions. So any oxidative process, whether that's facilitated by bacteria or not, is severely limited because of the solubility of oxygen at high altitude uh, or in saline solution. The much bigger problem is uh, the solution distribution. So as I already said, kind of that loosely, solution trickles through the ore bed um, and contacts the, 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 the rock on its path. But the, so the ideal scenario would be, this is a, a, an output from a model saying that the solution migrates through the heat in a sort of united front and the heat is saturated with solution homogeneously throughout and uh, all particles are in contact with the leach solution um, and uh, that gets then recovered in the drainage layer at the bottom. The reality is very, very different. And this is sort of like it's a model uh, system but that's something that's been verified with, um, with actual measurements, and that's to see that you will tend to have the heap saturated with solution only near the surface, and then uh, you have zones where the solution just channels through, as it's sort of shown here, and you have zones where the Or, uh, pockets of ore like these here uh, will actually have very poor permeability and therefore will likely not leach at all. 
um, and so make those heat leaching operations inefficient. Um, here, yeah, so just to kind of understand this a bit further, some observations in the field. Heaps are not irrigated with, uh, with, with sprinklers, but with uh, so-called drippers. So you have, uh, you have pipes that have little holes in them that the solution drip into the orbit at the discrete points. And that essentially sets up channels of solution flow through the orbit. And in between, you have basically, you're just relying on uh, um, uh, on, a set, on a gradual saturation of moisture, but there is no flowing solution in between. And that's actually something that we've observed in a, in a real heap. This is an old heap that's been dug open, and you can see here um, these discrete streaks where solution was channeling through um, with the bed in between the ore, in between is moist, but uh, there is no actual solution flow uh, through, that, through that bed. Um, we actually verified these patterns uh, also in the laboratory. So what we basically did, we used a, a, a medical PET scanner, which is basically using a radioactive uh, tracer fluid, and uh, can then create a 3D image of where that radioactive tracer fluid flows relative to where it doesn't flow. So we Distributing not homogeneously, but going through discrete little channels and, and, and pockets uh, of solution flow, and the rest of the bed not seeing the flowing solution. Yet, that whole orbit was wet, and that whole orbit does leach uh, to quite a large extent, but it, uh, the solution flow is everything but homogeneous through that system. Um, and then, as I already said earlier, there is also no real understanding of how solution and aeration uh, compete for space with each other in, in the orbit. Um, and then there are some other aspects that one needs to take into account, such as uh, CO2. If you have bioleaching, you need CO2 as a, as a uh, medium for growth for the bacteria. So CO2 comes in with air. But uh, uh, natural air has too little CO2 for efficient bioleaching. So that is also a question where does that go? Um, and so those are other aspects that slow down heat leaching. So all these aspects that I've discussed now uh, relate to the slowing down heat leaching. And uh, one needs to get a full understanding, a full handle on, in order to make heat leaching more efficient. Um, because you don't want things to slow down the process, as I hopefully explained, uh, you are because as soon as you slow down, you lose money uh, because you have the high inventory cost on the heat. So, um, <clears throat> but it's possible to speed up these processes. For example, as I said, by So, um, particularly CO2 in the context of bioleaching to maintain uh, a rapid extraction of, of the ore. So, research team and, and, and technology development have significantly improved the operability of, of heat leach operations uh, over the past 20 years, and, uh, and I hope that uh, that will continue to the point where one can, can consider heat leaching also for non. Uh, uh, as a genuine alternative technology. Then I want to still quickly touch on the uh, environmental aspects. So I mentioned earlier that uh, he heaps are, uh, of course, uh, people say, well, the, the spent heap sits there, it's an environmental liability. And then I just wanted to kind of just illustrate to you heaps and telling stamps. If you conventionally process a material, you will have telling stamps, so it does not that, that somehow by conventional processing you're circumventing that problem. And 
the tailing stamps are, are obviously lined in order to make sure they don't leach into the, into the underground, but so are heaps because you line them in order to recover the solution. So no problem there. Tailing stamps are highly impermeable once they're consolidated, but the consolidation phase, because tailing uh, materials get deposited wet, uh, will actually result in, a, in, in an initial phase of Spaces where the tailing stamps, at least at the point of disposing of the tailing, you have typically about 30% moisture. So heaps, the tailings are saturated with moisture, whereas heaps are definitely unsaturated. Tailing stamps are difficult to revegetate, to plant anything on top of them. Um, there is no re you, uh, there is of course potential to reprocess them for to extract additional value. But that's costly because you basically have to remind them. And that's an advantage of heat because you can just simply restart the heat. Because the heat is already packed, it's permeable, so you can just start uh, sprinkling solution on top of it uh, to recover additional value. And when with tailing stamps, you have the problem of uh, uh, post closure issues because of acid rock drainage generation. Whereas in heaps you can control it because in actual fact deliberately can continue leaching a heap until there is nothing in it anymore that can uh, uh, produce acid drop drainage. Whereas in, in, in tailings we have very little control over that. So they contain more or less the same tonnage, they have a similar footprint, they are both environmentally problematic for different reasons, but it's wrong to say heaps are more, present more often, spent heaps present more of an environmental burden than telling stamps. That's simply not true. Okay, so then the question is, uh, uh, is heat leaching then really just restricted to a... Uh, been looked at for uranium leaching mm -hmm. using an alkali chemistry, so that's still heat leaching, but using a, a carbonate system rather than a sulfate system, so it is an al alkaline chemistry rather than an acidic chemistry, and that brings great advantages because, as I said earlier, in an acid system you always leach the rock matrix, whereas in an alkaline system that stays pretty much untouched. So alkaline leaching is uh, still an attractive chemistry for for uranium. Rare earth, I mentioned, there's alternative chemistries that are being investigated for copper using uh, an ammonia system, and I'll talk about this in a moment, and for PGMs using a cyanide system. So gold is used for cyanide, but why not platinum group minerals like that and palladium and so forth. But that's, that's, that's just the conventional extraction of, of uh, uh, primary minerals. But it has also, heat leaching has also been explored for e-wastes, um, to leach them in column apparatus, um, or, but generally it has been investigated, but it hasn't really been explored systematically, and offers a vast potential for with secondary resources, ashes, tailings, slags, sludges, dust, all sorts of mineral processing waste materials that um, still contain valuable fractions, but at, obviously at too low a concentration to bother extracting it, but when heat leaching, that's the advantage. Yeah, it takes a long time, but if you deal with the waste, you don't have any sunken costs because then that's a good thing. But uh, the problem is a lot of these materials, particularly ashes, tailings, sludges, dusts, are 
very fine grained material, so they're not very really permeable, and you need to make them more permeable by basically agglomerating fine material with a, a coarser rock matrix. And that's the so called dual coat technology. So I want to quickly talk about two novel applications that we've explored um, uh, in the heat bleaching context. Um, the first one is uh, basically using a uh, low grade platinum mineral, platinum uh, ores, in this case the so called flat leaf ore, consists of a, um, a low grade charcoal pyrite, pyrite, uh, pyrotite, and uh, pentadite uh, sulfide mineral grains, um, in amongst which you have platinum group metals. So the grade of platinum group uh, metals in uh, total PGM grade in uh, in these ores is about 3 grams per ton. So it's a very low grade material. But because of course platinum and palladium are so valuable, people are uh, in still interesting to extract it. The conventional route involves milling to fine dust, floating, um, and then pyrometallurgical extraction of the, of, the, uh, of the sulfide phases in order to recover nickel, copper, and the PGMs called simultaneous group. So here we pro pro propose to say this is a low grade mineral, we can do Alkaline leach system, whereas bio leaching is an acid system, does not work well for charcoal tar. So we have we have tried both systems <coughs> uh, in order to first extract the metals uh, in the first stage, and then move to cyanide leaching of the PGMs of gold that's contained in that in that mineral phase, both through heat leaching, and tested that at the uh, at the laboratory scale using. The coated concentrate that I just mentioned and whole ore. Um, and uh, and so just to show you some of the results that we've seen, this is the apparatus that we use for this kind of test work. So these are uh, narrow wall columns, 10 millimeter, 100 millimeter diameter columns that we fill with ore. First stage and the second stage after some rinsing, we basically have cyanide leaching, and that is done in the, in the fume cover. That's why it's a different setup because of the, uh, of course, the inherent risks that you have. Um, and then just to show you some results here in this case, what we nicely demonstrated is that in actual fact, with ammonia leaching, the copper extraction becomes uh, near complete within a month within that column. So that's really quite rapid. Um, uh, nickel extraction, not so good, 40%. But uh, we also find substantial conversion of the, of the iron. Um, but that doesn't leach out because this ammonia system is, of course, an alkaline system. So at alkaline pH, uh, the, um, the iron will just precipitate and not be dissolved. Um, and then subsequently we leached the uh, platinum out with, uh, with cyanide leaching and it's a slow process, you get about, uh, after, after uh, 5 weeks you get about 35% extraction of the platinum but as you can see this is not completed, this is progressing at a slow continuous rate. Uh, whereas the bio leaching under comparable conditions, uh, similar reactor setup, 
uh, bio leaching is that because it's thermal fire, it's a slightly higher temperature, it shows a very different pattern. It goes initially fairly slowly for about two months, then it suddenly takes off, and then it gradually levels up. Uh, it still goes to the same final extraction, but it's a much, much slower process. Uh, and, except, and that's where kinetic analysis has to come in. You see here, the slope of the curve at its steepest is more or less the same. So the slope of uh, ammonia leaching or the slope of bio leaching at its fastest is actually identical. So the, uh, the kinetics of the reaction are not actually slower. The bio leaching has two problems. The one is that it takes a long time to get going. That's a sort of like a typical phenomenon in bio leaching. But the problem is more in just what happens here once we've done uh, with the why does it slow down here and not so much on this side. And the reason for that is that we essentially are looking at uh, effect. What the explanation here is that in the bio leaching process, we leach the iron and then we precipitate it as, a, as an iron hydroxide derocyte type material which uh, presents a very highly sorptive surface area. So the copper that is leached will actually become a Because the copper is being absorbed onto, onto the, the iron, it will get released in a much, much more gradual fashion. Um, and so we did some analysis of the ore um, um, that, we, uh, that we can take out of columns like that. And you can actually see how it has initially fresh ore as this grey granular material. And the longer you leach it, the more it becomes clumped together with this brown hard precipitate which is uh, relates to, to uh, uh, gerocyte. And so we did also some studies of uh, uh, analyzing the characteristics of this precipitation process of iron hydroxide, very common in, in, in many uh, hydrometallurgical processes. And you can see that it uh, always ends up in, in this very fine uh, 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 structure, skeletal structure that, uh, that has, offers a very high surface area for iron absorption. And we have also observed that on the field, remember this picture, um, where we have the ore that's between the solution flows, and it comes out and presents in this very dark brown uh, color that indicates the precipitation of these uh, iron hydroxide phases. And quickly, one uh, touch on one other novel application that is a, an environmental context where we actually use heat bio leaching to treat arsenic tailings or arsenopyrite tailings. So those were actually produced from a, a, an old gold operation uh, and the tailings were they just basically deposited as arsenopyrite. So very hazardous uh, <laughs> legacy. that's in the solution and then con under controlled conditions precipitated the scorodite which is a good way to sequester the arsenic uh, as a long term stable material. Um, so here's just some pictures of the, the different leach tests that we did and uh, the bacterial conditions that uh, I'm not going to go into that now but it, it was definitely found in the process that is at least uh, technically perfectly feasible. And when he said, just bring up the will to now dig up the arsenic tailings, put them on a heap and treat them in that way, um, because obviously there's still a cost associated with it and no revenue. And that is unfortunately the problem with a lot of uh, environmental process technology uh, that whatever you do, you put money in, you don't get revenue from it. Unless, of course, if you didn't test it in this case, there's still some residual gold in this material that you might be able to extract uh, at the same time.
but we didn't look for that in this particular study. So to bring this then to a conclusion, I, I, I uh, hopefully made it clear that although heat leaching looks like a simple process, um, it is actually uh, a fairly complex scale, a uh, complex process at many different scales. Looking, at, you have to take into account quite a number of physical chemical phenomena that occur uh, during the leaching process. And how exactly you actually these, these different phenomena interplay is uh, not easy to grasp. through mathematical models represent all these different processes interplaying with each other uh, with the different kinetics which allows us a pretty good prediction at least of what's going on in these column operators and use that data then to scale up to heat leach operations so the tools exist to um, appreciate the complexity and then use that the insights from that in order to predict uh, um, or, or develop scenarios where heat leaching becomes more optimal. So as I said, economic analysis shows that heat operate of optimally operated heat can in actual fact be quite productive, can be economically viable and economically favorable over conventional bio, uh, uh, conventional metallurgical process technologies, um, but it really requires quite strictly that they need to be operated reliably at their optimum. And that is easier said than done. And so there's still a lot of development that needs to go into that to achieve that. So many new applications of heat leachings are possible if we can find this optimal operation regime. And then therefore you have significant potential not only for extraction from primary materials but also for remediation uh, uh, purposes and recovery of waste applications. So with that I say thank you. And efficiency of heat leaching can increase to about 20%. Uh, how many commercial products we can make? Or if it, it can increase it to uh, 50%, uh, then how much economic, um, uh, how, to say, how many economic products we can make? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the, how, if, how much, how efficient you have to operate a heap in a given context depends very much. Uh, uh, it's different from, from case to case. So uh, you need to understand always like what are you comparing it against. So in um, in the example that I gave, uh, we were comparing it. We looked at a, at a fairly at a medium grade of zinc sulfide ore. It had a, 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 a zinc, an average zinc grade of about nine percent, which is quite high. And so for zinc grade like that, conventional flotation and uh, preparing of a concentrate is uh, still a viable process. Um, whereas, <coughs> but uh, if you look at copper ores, uh, copper ores generally have a grade of less than 1% copper. Um, so now concentration, milling concentration becomes economically borderline. And there is, people talk about a cutoff point of about half a percent. Um, that's why they say the conventional milling flotation process is no longer viable to produce copper. profitable at 1%. Uh, 
Yeah. And so you might have actually seen where it's rather build the heap if you can operate it profitably, rather than build a, a, a concentrator plant. So, but that you need to weigh up in each particular case. And for each ore, uh, and that's always the problem with why mineralogy is such an important field, because every ore is different, and every ore brings its own particular problems with the, with, uh, the uh, impurities and the, the nature of the gang. So for example, I said, the gang minerals, they can easily dissolve in acid. So if you have an acid leach operation, and the material contains the, uh, a very soluble gang, then you might actually find that heat leaching is not viable, because too much gang, acid gets consumed through dissolving gang. Um, but uh, then you might find other materials, and the, the zinc case is a good example, why we even began to look at, um, at, the, uh, at the heat teaching was because that particular zinc ore uh, contained a lot of manganese. Now manganese uh, is actually problematic because you cannot separate manganese from zinc in the flotation process. And so it will go into a leaching process, and even there, it's difficult to separate the manganese from, from the leaching. In the heat leaching case, it wouldn't matter, because the manganese wouldn't be touched. You're only dissolving the zinc, and the manganese stays behind. So that makes it more attractive. But, uh, so there's no hard rule to say if you make it 10% more efficient, then it will be more viable. That really depends from by case by case. But Be a long-term environmental friendly method. Okay. Yeah, bio is, um, and it's, it's, uh, I'm always at, at, at pains to stress, uh, it's just a form of hydrometallurgical processing. It's like one particular chemistry that you use and you have now my four organisms participating in it. Um, in many, in many each operations, they actually occur naturally uh, because they, they like the environment in, 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 in which you uh, have it. If you want to, uh, if you target them or not, is as as the same degree. So the 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 the, the, the viability for bio leaching uh, is definitely a given, but you need to create an environment in which they can, uh, in which they can thrive. So there's an interesting uh, case that I've been involved in. Um, People in, in Chile, they've uh, looked at um, um, in recent years at developing uh, using chloride uh, in solution um, for, for heat leaching of sulfide minerals. Now, charcoal pyrite in particular dissolves well in, in, in the chloride solution, but, uh, but the problem is obviously uh, chloride is toxic to, uh, to bacteria, they can't grow in, in that environment. So they thought, well, but that's fine, uh, because chloride leaching of charcoal pyrite, in actual fact, it oxidizes the, 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 the sulfide to eliminate. One look at it and I said, well, you still need oxygen because you're still oxidizing something. Yes. You know, it's maybe not as much as, as, as you would do with bio leaching, but you still need to array the heat okay. because what, what you end up with is, is you're basically strangling the process because there's no oxygen. So, it, it, so there's definitely a future uh, an, an application for bio leaching because they demonstrated that bio leaching does work. But they thought the chlor they can get away, um, the chloride leaching would be cheaper. But uh, in the end, it turned out it doesn't actually work. So now they're starting to think about using bio leaching again. So it goes in circles. Oh, yes, thank you very much. Sure. Anyone else? Hang on, wait. Oh. 
I think particularly when you deal with the uh, processing of waste, um, you always need to look at economics. Because if it costs money, then nobody wants to spend, wants to do it. You know, if it costs more money, then it burns you. But if you can develop a process that at least pays for itself, so that the, 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 the revenue you get from recovering valuables uh, is the same as what you need to pay to operate the process, then you're business. And that is, that is the, the thing, again, one, one needs to evaluate. Heat leaching offers the operability that they're simple and cheap processes, uh, as compared to building uh, a, a chemical plant uh, with tanks and reactors. Um, so if, you, if it can be made to work efficiently enough in a heat leach environment, you are more likely to, uh, to recover money, valuable from this, cost efficiently, and so that the whole process at least pays for itself um, and what you end up with, the, the, the waste that you end up after the process is more benign, it's more environmentally safer than, uh, than what you start off with. Um, but that always uh, requires a systematic evaluation of the whole process to achieve. So you can't just say, uh, you can quite easily take any material, you put it in a column and you react it with whatever reaction and say, look, heat bleaching, it works, you know, you can extract the metal. But that alone doesn't tell you anything. Um, so you need to then use this information, include it into a, an economics processing. To take uh, to uh, to come in, so people are starting to look at processes like that to say, um, does the extraction of value from waste still uh, at least pay for itself and give us ultimately a more more stable waste than what we're starting off with? Okay, now. A professor of tourism. Thank you very much for your wonderful speech. I would like to ask a question. Uh, do you think uh, what's the future development trend of climatology? You biology? Thank you. You're asking climatology in general or specifically biology? Climatology. Uh, climatology in general. Uh, I think. I think. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, an interesting question uh, that I've just grappled with lately um, because a lot of people sort of talk about hydrometallurgy versus pyrometallurgy. And, and, and quite often that is a kind of not really uh, a, a, a fair comparison because many processes, minerals processes where you use a, a, high, a thermal process step still involve hydrometallurgical process. You roast the material but then you still leach it. So, um, so to kind of talk about hydrometallurgy versus pyrometallurgy is, is nonsense anyway. So uh, you, you can ask more generally, what's the future of metallurgical processing? Will we one day no
will stay there for 100 years. So we will continuously need additional metals that are being mined. Perhaps not so much primary metals anymore uh, in the future as we are mining now, but we will still need mines. We will still need to process metals. And even if we just entirely rely on recovering all our metals from our, from our, old, from our own waste, we still need metallurgical processes to extract that. And hydrometallurgy will play a role in this. And, uh, and maybe what we need to look at more is uh, processes that uh, use less toxic chemicals. So bio-leaching is possibly an opportunity. But bio-leaching, let's face it, bio-leaching takes place at very acidic solutions. It takes place at pH 1.5. So that's not exactly an environmentally friendly environment. So, um, so I always have a problem with people saying environmentally friendly. You say, Less environmental harmful is a is, is a better term to use, but but yeah, definitely there's uh, a lot of people looking now at organic compounds for metal complexation uh, uh, to aid in, in leaching processes. So there is definitely a lot of uh, areas of research where uh, environmentally more benign type processes are considered. But hydrometallurgy as a discipline, I think, is to stay for a long time. So. Thank you. 